Why is it so important to know that Jesus exposes elder brother lostness as being as wrong and destructive as younger brother lostness? Who needs to know this? The elder brother of the world desperately need to see themselves in this mirror. Jesus aimed this parable primarily at the Pharisees to show them who they were and to urge them to change. As we said, the younger brother knew he was alienated from the father, but the elder brother did not. And that's why elder brother lostness is so dangerous. It's so dangerous for us as Christians to think we're in the right path, we were doing the right thing, we're being legalistic, we're going to church, we're turning up online for our meetings, I'm doing all the work for charity, ticking all the boxes, but still don't have a relationship with Jesus, still not yearning for a relationship with Jesus, still not recognizing that I am lost. That's why elder brother is dangerous. In church, and lost. Elder brothers don't go to God and beg for healing for their conditions. They don't even acknowledge they have a condition. They see nothing wrong with their condition and that can be very fatal. If you know you are sick, you may choose to go to the doctor, you may choose not to. If you don't know you're sick, you won't and you'll just suddenly die. The younger brother of the world also desperately need to see this. We see the attitude of the elder brother in the story and we begin to realize one of the reasons the younger brother wanted to leave in the first place <laughs> is not so much that he hated daddy, but older brother made it so difficult for struggling Christian to stay at home in church. Yeah. There are many people today who have abandoned any kind of religious faith because they see clearly that the majority and the major religions are simply full of elder brothers who have no space for younger brothers. They have come to the conclusion that religion is one of the greatest source of misery and hypocritness and strife in the world. And guess what? Jesus say, through this parable, they are right. Yeah. The anger and superiority of elder brothers all growing out of insecurity Fear and inner emptiness can create a huge body of guilt-ridden, fear-ridden, spiritually blinded people, which is one of the greatest source of social injustice, war, and violence in our world. It is typical for people who have turned their backs on religion to believe that Christianity is no different. I spoke about this girl I met while we were out giving up food a few weeks ago, two or three weeks ago. And she heard where we were from. She walked away bitter because of church hurt because she got pregnant as a teenager in church. They have been in church, women with elder brother types. They say Christianity is just another religion. But Jesus says, no, that is not true. Everybody knows that the Christian gospel calls us away from licentiousness of younger brotherness, but few realize it also condemns moralistic elder brotherness. Our big cities are filled with younger brothers who fled from churches in the heartland that were dominated by elder brothers. If you go to the cities of the world like New York and Sydney and London and Kingston and all these places, and if you try to open a new church, you might think that there are many secular people that had no familiarity with Christianity at all. But to your surprise, you will understand that there are many people who were raised in churches and in devout families in these big cities, but far away from them as possible is their belief in Christ. One person shared their experience about New York City and how he thought that they were gonna be all secular. But one year into his ministry, he had two or 300 people attending his services. And he was asked, who is coming to your church? Upon reflection, he answered that it was about one third of non-believers, one third believers, 
and one third recovering believers, younger brothers. He said he'd met so many younger brothers who had been hurt and offended by elder brothers that neither they nor I were sure whether they still believe that Christian faith or not. And that's the reality of the world. You go on YouTube and see how many of them vex with our church. <laughs> vex with because of church hurt. And we repeat the famous Gandhi statement. I don't believe in you Christians, but I like your Jesus. Okay. The most common example of this can be seen in many young adults who had come from more conservative parts of the US to take their undergraduate degrees in New York City schools. And here they met the kind of person they had been warned about for years, those with liberal views on sex and politics and culture. And despite what they had been led to believe, these people were kind, reasonable, and open-hearted. When the students began to experience a change in their own views, they found that many people back home, especially in the churches they grew up in, responded in a hostile and begotted way to people who stumble. I was listening to the program yesterday from Southern Caribbean Unit Conference. I think I think of the camp conference that had Trinidad, maybe Grenada, and that. And they were talking about fixing your sister's crown. It was women's convention. And well, the point they brought out is, you know, how we treat people when they've messed up, got pregnant, had abortion, how we treat people when they were in, they experience domestic violence and intimate partner violence in the relationship. And, and when they receive grief and loss that make them walk away and vex with God, how do we treat them? And then we find a group of people who were alienated from the church for different reasons and supporting each other and, and 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 the gossips we gossip people and and the ones who were perfect that fall and didn't know how to deal with their fall it was a current copy of what's going on in our churches but the theme of the day was written by one of these the sisters this is you know to make it in we have to keep our eyes on jesus and we have to hold and fix each sister crown and by fixing each sister's crown we will end up fixing and somebody will fix or straighten our own crown. Younger brothers are willing to come to our churches because they say that we made a clear distinction he shared between the gospel and religious moralism. And that provided an opportunity in which they could explore Christianity from a new perspective. And that's what we see in many churches that are growing. They take a different perspective and it doesn't mean watering on the gospel. You see, Jesus was here today. Many of you staunch Christian wouldn't even follow him because who he hangs with, just like the people of his days, you would complain and your spirit would vex. How could this be Jesus? Why would he be hanging with them? It is natural for younger brothers to think that elder brothers and Christianity are exactly the same thing, but Jesus says they are not. In this parable, Jesus deconstruct the religiosity that is one of the main problems with the world. Too much religiosity. When I meet patients and it says, I'm not religious, it's a neither am I. I'm not religious. <laughs> no, I'm not. I believe of Jesus Christ. I'm not religious. In this parable, Jesus says to us, and they look at me when I say that, and I'm like, no, I'm not religious. No, no, no. I'm not a religious person. Not any religiosity. I'm into Jesus. Would you, is this parable, Jesus say to us, would you please be open to the possibility that the gospel, real Christianity, is something very different from religion? Many of you are members of religion, but you are not members, many of us, I should say, let me take that back, are members of religion, and we would do anything to protect the religion, even at the cost of the hurting and speaking up for those who have been abused. We want to protect the religion. Because me, I don't need to protect God, I tell people. You can be fixed with God all you want. The God I know, he's patient, he's kind, and he will sit with you in you with it, and he'll be waiting for you. Same place where you left him. And even when you don't want him, he will carry you when you can't carry yourself. He will gather your tears in the bottle, as he says. And he's a gentleman. He won't force himself on you. But he will make you come around. Yeah. I don't need to protect God or defend God. He can defend himself. Speaking of, speaking of me. 
So you can be vexed all you want. Vex all you want, we got. <laughs> I've been vexed with him before. <laughs> I'm saying. So you sit there and not be real. You see, I tell people, go tell God you're vexed with him. Go tell him you're vexed with him. He will sort you out. He will sort you out. He will. Be real with God. But Jesus says they are not. In his parable, Jesus deconstructs the religiosity that is one of the main problems in the world. In this parable, Jesus says to us, would you please be open to the possibility that the gospel and Christianity is something different from religion? That gives many people hope that there is a way to know God that doesn't lead to the pathologies of moralism and religiosity. Many people say, uh, I believe in God, I believe in God or a God or, or a higher power, but I, I'm not into religion. I'm like, that's okay. God didn't call you to religion. Call you to himself and fellowship with believers. When I'm saved by your denomination, then you're not. You're not going to be faith saved because, oh, I'm a Christian. It's going to be saved based on who Jesus is to you and what's your relationship with Jesus Christ. Do you know him? Do you know about him? Even the devil believe and tremble. So belief is not enough. We have to go beyond belief to be transformed and to have that personal relationship with Jesus Christ. There's a third group of people who need to understand elder brother lostness. Your position in church ain't gonna save you. You're turning up and not even focusing on the word and busybody all over the place and not getting nothing. It ain't gonna save you. There must be time for the Holy Spirit to speak to your heart. Spend time and wrestle with God. There is third group of people who need to understand elder brother lostness. There's a big difference between an elder brother and a real gospel-believing Christian. But there are also many genuine Christians who are elder brotherish. <laughs> if you came to Christ out of being a younger brother, there is always a danger of part partially re relapsing into addictions or other younger brother sins. But if you become a Christian out of being an elder brother, you can even more easily slide back into elder brother attitudes and spiritual deadness. If you have not grasped the gospel fully and deeply, you will return to being condescending, condemning, anxious, insecure, joyless, and angry all the time. Elder brothers have an undercurrent of anger toward life circumstances. All grudges long and bitterly look down on people of other races and religions and lifestyles and experience like a joyless, crushing drudgery have little intimacy and joy in their prayer lives and have a deep insecurity that makes them overly sensitive to criticism and rejection, yet fierce and merciless in condemning others. What a terrible picture, and yet the rebellious path of the younger brother is obviously not a better alternative. Most people who follow the philosophy of individual fulfillment and self-discovery do not make a shipwreck of their lives like the younger son. Most religious people who think that God will save them for their, their moral efforts are not nearly as heartless and angry as their older son. Isn't Jesus exaggerating, you may say? The answer is no. He is explaining that while most people do not arrive at these extreme places, each approach to life has the seeds of his own destruction in it, which draws its adherent towards a spiritual destination he describes so well. Jesus' parable creates something of a crisis for the thoughtful listener. He has vividly portrayed both of the world's two spiritual paths, the basic ways each, of, each offers for finding happiness, relating to God, and dealing with our problems. However, he exposes them both as profoundly mistaken, as dead ends. He clearly wants to take some radically different approach with us. But what is it? Where do we find it? We will find the answer when we realize that Jesus deliberately left someone out of this parable. He did this so that we would look for him and finding him, find our way home at last. Dear Heavenly Father, we just want to thank you, God, for helping us to find our way home at last. For helping us to recognize where we are with you right now and how much we need you, Lord, and we need to own up to where we're at, to be real and true, so we can find our way home before it's too late. Lord, I want to lift up those who are ill. We continue to lift Jay and Al, and we continue to ask for your presence in their lives and their circumstances. 
We lift up those who are grieving, Lord. Those who are hurting. We lift up those who are celebrating their birthdays. There's so many 16th birthdays in this last week. <laughs> Lord, we just want to thank you, God, for your goodness and your grace and your mercy in our lives. We want to thank you for God, or oh, you have blessed these no longer babies and children. No, no, it's someone's child. They always can be your child, but they're teenagers and adults, Lord. And you have kept them over these years, Lord. I pray that the example that we have set, that somehow, God, they will recognize the need to have and to maintain a relationship with Jesus, that their qualifications and their exams and their colored dates and all they receive, Lord, that this comes from you and not their own efforts and their own smartness, Lord. Because if they should attain everything in this world and not attain Jesus, Lord, it's worthless. Be with Daniel and Gabriel and their mom as they finalize their dad. God, we just ask you to be with all of us today, Lord. We invite you, Holy Spirit, to come in and we ask you, God, to remove the both the younger and the elderly brother and the in-between traits it's leading them on a, on a path away from you, Lord. God, I pray that we will come to know you more in intimate ways as Enoch walked with you, Lord. Father, amidst all the challenges we face, God, may we see you evidently in our life and in our circumstances. And may we come to know you as Lord and Savior of our lives and forgive us of our sins, Lord, and save us, comes with me in Jesus' name. Lord, I ask you to break the yoke that binds us, that these bad yokes, Lord, and Take a, always take on your yoke because it's easy and slight. And to bring us together as families and friends in relationship with you in Christ's name. Amen. Bless, bless. Have a blessed day.